a little comment. The last speaker was on coalescent models, which are produced by John Kingman, and he loves those models. And the ones I'm going to talk about now, he really does not like. So that's kind of. Uh, hi, yeah, so today I'll be talking about. Um, I was just thinking a little bit about the information we might have in an epidemic time series from the perspective of reproduction numbers. This is work with Crystal Donnelly and Alex Zarebski. Uh, we have like a preprint here with a bit more of the details that I'm going to give a whirlwind tour of. And just as a, a minor plug, this is part of like a series of work where we're trying to like integrate a bit more of engineering theory into epidemic models, and I should be advertising a postdoc soon, so if that's cool, uh, interesting to anyone, please do get in touch uh, or tweet me. So sort of the general question is how could we think about changes in pathogen transmissibility, and why would we want to do it? Uh, I mean, the pandemic gives a lot of good examples, but effectively you'd want to know what factors might have changed, such as the emergence of some new variants. You might want to test the hypothesis about what might be driving Transmission, where this is just like the rate of spread of the epidemic, could be super spreading events. Uh, you could look at sort of this transmissibility term before and after interventions to kind of get a notion of how effective they might be, though there's some problems with that. And obviously to sort of for do a bit of forecasting. But what we're more interested in here is what does meaningful mean? And we also want to summarize the dynamics and we want to be sort of reliable given some sort of practical data. So just to kind of like a quick recap of what uh, epidemic models and what this number is. Um, so this effective reproduction number is often seen as a good way to measure the transmissibility of an epidemic. And it effectively behaves as a threshold parameter. It ha for those of you in um, sort of linear systems and so on, it has a relationship to the dominant pole of the epidemic process. It's effectively, if you have growth, you have this reproduction number at time t r of t above one. If you have like a control situation, it's below one. There's a couple other caveats to that, but that's basically how it behaves. And you could use that to ask, you know, if the control was working. So if we applied a control here and went below one, we might say it is. If a second wave is likely, it would be like, if you could imagine like a jump in R later on as well. And then of like the model for a sort of simple, but still widely used model for X sort of describing this type of dynamics is called a renewal model. It has links to branching processes, age-dependent ones. Uh, it has links to autoregressive models. But simply put, it's the infections at time t, uh, well, with some noise distributed according to the reproduction numbers and this lambda of t term, which could be considered uh, as the sort of circulating infections that could spread forward. Uh, and that's sort of simply composed as a weighting or a convolution of past infections with this W. W here is a generation time distribution. Uh, its shape sort of describes different types of epidemics, but it effectively is the time. So WU means that there's, it takes U time units for a, a primary infection to lead to a secondary infection. And so sort of in this process, it sort of describes an effective branching where lambda of T is multiplied up by R of T. So the question I want to sort of think about and pose is very simple. It turns out that these terms, RT, IT, lambda of T, we just can't observe them, or it's very hard to observe. It's very hard to know the timing of when an infection actually occurs. So we have to use some sort of practical measure. So we might use a time series of cases or deaths, or even more recently, people have proposed looking at uh, uh, viral abundances in wastewater, for example. And you could just ask a very simple question here. Well, say we had the infections across time. So I want to, t this is like the unobservable variable. We know we could get some estimate of R from that across time. So that's one to tau just means the time series from one to up to tau. Uh, but what actually happens when we get these proxies is that we have some sort of underreporting of infections, which can be treated as a sampling process. And we have a bunch of delays or lags on those infections, which could be seen as also reordering the way that infections or how we see infections. And here I'll just look at cases which are uh, denoted with C and deaths D. And you could again derive some type of estimate. And I want to ask the question like, how do we compare these two and maybe get some notion of reliability? And I'm going to do it a very simple way as well. Uh, so as far as I'm aware, no analytic framework anywhere exists. Uh, and I'm kind of like going a bit uh, antithetical to the point of this uh, whole conference series in that I want to avoid simulations altogether if possible. Uh, 
and all computations. Um, so we want to look for something that might be generalizable so we could change our notions of noise and kind of understand, so just to understand how these components might control information in some sense. And we could kind of like see an example here. So say we had a tr no, true number of infections in black and we, sa we do some underreporting, which is with the sampling distribution, we could get a bunch of curves here, which could count as cases. We could do a similar thing, but instead apply a delay of some kind and we get a next set of curves and we just kind of want a way to sort of relate these two to, e to each other to kind of understand which of these noise sources might be more important and that's why we want something that's a bit interpretable. And our approach is kind of like, let's look at Fisher, what Fisher information and statistical experimental design might provide. So we make one key simplifying assumption, which I guess helps the math become really tractable, which is that we assume that we set up our time series such that we could treat every RT as more or less independent. And you could kind of do that for COVID. You might say, well, let's take a weekly uh, time unit or step. Uh, we'll define some reporting fractions with rho and some delay probabilities where this is sort of the probability of a delay of x time units. And if you do that, this is sort of a model for cases, so it's kind of uh, a generalized renewal model, but the sort of the key takeaway here is just that if you set the delays obviously to be zero uh, and the reporting fractions to be one, you get back the perfect model. And we could compute the Fisher information uh, under this approach, and you'll get some simple expression here where this F is actually the cumulative uh, delay on an infection to it being reported. And again, you could sort of you know, set these conditions and get back the, the best Fisher information if you could observe infections. So what we decided was, well, maybe we could work out the total. I should probably mention that like, we're using Fisher information here uh, specifically to think about what's the asymptotic or best uh, precision of an unbiased estimator of R. And we're kind of saying, well, say we have a bunch of R's from one to tau that we want to infer from all the cases, so the case time series, uh, what could we do? So the optimal design theory suggests that you might want to focus on the determinant of a Fisher information matrix. Because we made that ind independence assumption, we could actually write that down. I actually gave the square root of this, which I'll explain why, why just now. And we call that the total information in the case time series from one to tau. So it's a product of terms which have these noises and these unknown lambdas and r's. And that sort of has like a geometric significance because it's inversely proportional to the volume of an uncertainty ellipsoid around the unbiased estimates of R. So if you took them in multiple dimensions, you'd get this ellipsoid and you could kind of measure the volume with the inverse of that. And what we're proposing is this ratio, which is simply take that sort of total information divided by the perfect case, if we could see all the infections, and you'll get this um, product where uh, quite nicely, uh, obviously we've done it because a little bit of the assumptions, but quite nicely, we no longer have the lambdas, we no longer have the r's, we could sort of compute this purely from knowledge of the noise. So we don't have to do simulations of actual epidemics here, this is already kind of free of some of the unknowns. And to, but we also want a bit of interpretability to kind of understand how different noise sources might matter in our ability to infer r. So we could say, imagine another model equivalent which just had uh, sort of sampling fraction or reporting rate of theta, and we could kind of uh, equate those two things, and you'll get an answer that says, well, the information, uh, or I guess relative information in cases relative to true infections, is simply a product of geometric means. Where this is the geometric mean of all the reporting rates across time, this is the geometric mean of the cumulative delay probabilities. And this is quite interesting for our purposes because it says, first of all, we could look at these sort of independently and each noise source that we add, well, in many scenarios, will tend to add on another geometric mean term. So we kind of have like a little heuristic that says, well, each noise source, its quality is determined by its geometric mean. And we could immediately get some like simple results from design theory from that, which is that the mean must lie between the minimum and the maximum. And given some input to that mean alpha, and a constraint that, say, the sum of those alphas uh, have to uh, meet some other like standard mean constraint, we know that the most uniform input is the one that maximizes that geometric mean. So why is that useful? 
So let's look at a couple sort of examples. We might have, uh, so these are sort of distributions by which you might un like report infection. So for example, this one says uh, a lot of the time we'll either report all of the infections or lose quite a lot of them randomly. And this one is a bit more deterministic. You kind of just like put that into the metric and you could see like for the blue one, as you'd expect, uh, the, the theta, which is the effective information, is quite low. It's highest for these more deterministic or constant uh, type scenarios. And this kind of says, well, constant reporting or reporting at a, some constant fraction of the time is optimal, which is supported by the literature. But it also says that if we were to complete this process at different means, so mean reporting rates, you'd get sort of a diagram like this. And so the key point just to take away from that is that you could get many combinations of means and variances that will give you about the same information. And sort of the reason we even looked at that in the first place is just to sort of uh, go against an idea about higher variability. We want to say higher variability in reporting on its own does not guarantee worse reliability. We could do the same for delays, but of course we're using cumulative distribution functions now. Uh, in this case, we again know that the most constant-like or uniform-like cumulative distribution function will give you the best answer. Uh, we've, these are from a negative binomial delay distribution uh, with mean delay 10. And in this case, we have, uh, again, the blue, blue, and again, the most sort of variable one, obviously. K here is the dispersion parameter of the negative binomial distribution. And again, you see sort of like a similar picture where for a fixed amount of information. You could have uh, you know, different variabilities, different dispersions. But what's interesting is that this sort of contradicts a little bit of standard intuition, which says that actually more deterministic type delays, which would give you these kinds of CDFs, are actually worse in terms of information. And the reason for that is if you have a more dispersed delay, you get, even though like you might have a few cases with very large lags, you get quite a quite a large number with small lags, and that gives you timely information. So why, why even bother to do all this? What's the whole point of this? Well, so this entire study was just um, inspired by a question about deaths, if death data is more reliable than case data for inferring reproduction numbers. And that comes up from, there's a common assumption in the epidemic modeling literature. I think it's untested, I haven't seen too much in the literature published that suggests that it has been looked at in a specifically rigorous way. But there's this assumption that the death data is more reliable for something like COVID-19. Uh, and that is based on quite reasonable uh, you know, viewpoints. One, that we have wildly fluctuating testing rates. We might miss a large number of cases. We kind of expect deaths to be reported in a more stable way. The recent evidence suggests that may not be the case. And sort of death counts may not, you know, they're not really dependent on people deciding whether they want to test or not. So it's not behavioral dependent or how they mix. So you could then write down uh, a death model, which is again a generalized renewal model. And kind of the only thing to take away here is that you get another breakdown where we have a geometric mean of this new term, which is the infection fatality ratio. And that's sort of the proportion of infections that lead to death. We have the sigma term, which is then the proportion of deaths that are reported. And we have this H, which is sort of the cumulative delay from infection to death. Uh, and well, generally for actually this process, this, this will actually be just an upper bound on its actual value, but that wouldn't matter. So we can then pose the question again, which one is better? We could rearrange our equations. You'll get some sort of threshold criteria that suggests a geometric mean of the reporting rates divided by the sort of death reporting rates has to be greater than or equal to uh, a delay, inverted delay mean. And we're going to give a bunch of advantages to death data. We're going to allow it to be perfectly reported, so there's no underreporting of deaths. And we're going to give uh, an infection fatality ratio of 1%. So 1% of infections lead to death, which is a little bit higher than what's estimated in the literature. We're also going to give another advantage, which is that we know that the, in, the delay from infection to death is much larger often than the delay from infection to a case report. And we're going to say, well, we're going to let that this side to be maximized by its top value, which is one. So then that breaks down into a much simpler criteria where we use estimates from the literature of potential reporting rates. So we're just saying the geometric mean of the reporting rates given these estimates has to be greater than or equal to about 1%. And we could 
look at a bunch of different distributions, which we draw from beta ones, and we'll find that for a lot of cases, really, you can't say that the death data is more reliable, at least in this context of inferring across the MLEs. And you could kind of see that by how many of these uh, sort of parameter values and the information metrics go above this, inf this uh, that's the IFR, is that 0.01, go above that metric. So we could say, if you look at sort of as a proportion, even at the very lowest value so far estimated from the literature, which is a 7% reporting rate, we still have about 45% of parameter combinations in this case, leading to uh, actually the case data being the more informative metric. So what's sort of the kind of like benefits of something like this? So because we have relied on some simplistic models, but it does give us kind of like a common denominator with which we could look at different types of noise sources. So we could get a sort of somewhat rigorous view of the relative reliability of a time series for inferring reproduction numbers. And I should point out inferring reproduction numbers from these time series is actually very common. So it's been sort of reported by the government, it's used by a bunch of, uh, a lot of modelers, though there are more complex and perhaps more sort of realistic models you could use as well. Uh, so sort of from this analysis, we could generate some insight because we think that uh, there is some missing insight on how to compare different uh, time series when you want to look at this growth rate parameter, the reproduction number. And we're saying, well, it seems at least from this analysis, it's very unlikely that the death data would be better. And sort of the insight from that is very simple, is that this infection fatality ratio means that even before you start looking at how good death data might be, you've thrown away 99% of possible infections. Um, we could apply this a bit more practically, as long as we have estimates of the different distributions. So going back on this uh, sort of insight, if we just put in some answers for COVID, we will get that sort of fits of um, story, which is like, if it's a, in this case, we've used logs just for visualization, but if it's positive, we know that the case data is better. But for Ebola, because it has actually quite a strong, uh, well, infection fatality ratio, uh, despite its uh, reasonably good reporting as well, in a sense, we would see that actually it's the inverse. So the death data is almost surely more reliable for Ebola data. So this is providing a few analytical insights. And perhaps one thing you could do with this is you could pinpoint bottlenecks. Because you could pull out which geometric mean might be more important, you could kind of get an idea of where you might want to put surveillance resources, whether it be to speed up the reporting of cases or to perhaps do more random sampling to improve the reporting fractions. And uh, a lot of data sources, including infection prevalence, so this is, uh, there have been all these random surveys where they look at the potential prevalence, react studies they're called, uh, it's hospitalizations or even the virus wastewater, they could all be written or have been written as renewal models, so they could be used within this framework. But there are some limitations we're pointing out. Uh, undoubtedly, we've, been, we've used simplistic Poisson models. And, we, and in there, there's a well-mixed assumption. So for example, uh, when I was uh, looking at that renewal model, what I'm saying is that anyone can infect anyone else with equal probability. Uh, so that's a problem, but uh, studies that have used more realistic data-driven uh, network models so that actually look at how many people someone might infect and then try to infer these reproduction numbers, some of them have shown that uh, that extra level of detail does not actually improve uh, inference, or at least is not guaranteed to anyway. Obviously, we use Fisher information with asymptotic measure, and we've assumed the independence uh, on, on the RTs across the time series. Uh, we could get around some of that. Uh, we could, for example, replace R of T with its variance stabilizing transform, which is 2 square root R. Uh, you'd get the same results because it's an information ratio. Those terms tend to cancel out. Um, and we could put non uh, if we want to account for dependencies or correlations, we could append non-diagonal terms in our Fisher matrix and still do the determinants. It might not be as elegant, but you will get uh, some reasonable answers. And perhaps like a bit for the more information theoretic people, uh, it does have a nice relationship to the complexity of the models that we're looking at because you could look at the description length of a model in bits, which is a measure of how complex it is in a sense. And we could, if we wrote that down, and that's more in the paper, you would find that it does depend on the total information of the time series, well, with a log. And, kind of, and sort of just to end off the entire point of 
even doing a study like this is just that we want to raise the question that sometimes is ignored in the literature or it, or it is handled but perhaps with mass simulation so you can't get as much direct insights is just that we want to think a little bit more carefully about how we put data together especially as pandemic or epidemic response becomes more data driven and kind of like the first question you could ask about this is well why didn't we just use all the data sources at once uh, and sort of combine them in some sensible way to improve our estimation of r and we could but you'd have to then do a uh, consensus weights and one way of weighing different data sources like say cases or deaths or so on is to use the inverse variance which then kind of almost takes you back to these sort of fisher information angles so we think it is at least good to sort of interrogate this type of question uh more often uh thank you for your time so thank you chris uh, do we have any questions for chris Thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, probably I missed it, but uh, you mentioned at the beginning the problem of the, problem of, um, the testing behavior, now it changes. In your results, uh, how is that uh, accounted for? So what we did is we, so when we were looking particularly, well, I guess, yeah, I guess the first thing to know is, so testing behavior would be sort of within this row parameter, which is sort of a reporting rate across time. So that could vary both across time and stochastically, if you choose. Uh, you just have to maybe compute things in. Um, you might just have to compute conditional on potential values of that. And then when we did the comparison here of cases against deaths, what we did, oh, so, uh, yeah, what we did is we used a very variable, sort of a priori quite variable reporting rates that should even be a bit more it is a bit more than some estimated variances around the 7% and 38%. So we try to get as much variability in there as possible to kind of account for possible types of testing behavior because obviously they'll be specific to specific areas. So we kind of wanted to say, let's like bound that variability with a bigger box and then kind of look at the estimates. Thanks. So again, thank you for the talk. This is following up on that question, just trying to understand more of the details of your model. So your rho t is your testing rate, and is that fixed for each time interval where you're um, estimating rt, or can that sort of vary within the time interval? Uh, yeah, so it, it is fixed across in the sense that uh, at every, because I've set a base time unit, it wouldn't change in between you know, it's like at every time, you know, this is like a sample of what it could be. But it can vary across time and across like ensembles of that kind of like, you know, like multiple realizations of potential rows. And then are you estimating RT within each of those? Within, yeah, so you could do that. What we did is we just, um, so there's a lot of methods that nicely give you the maximum likelihoods of yeah. RT. Usually they apply deconvolution algorithms. So we know that we could get that quite, cleanly. So what we're really saying is how much variability exists around those sort of MLEs. So we're not explicitly using any inference method. Okay. Just trying to frame how I would describe the problem of variable uh, uh, testing rates affecting reproduction rates would be that if your testing rate is declining, then your observed cases also decline. And that sort of interaction between sort of how the time scale of which your report testing rate is varying and the time scale of which you're reporting reporting rate, yeah yeah but what often happens is like so even if you describe this in some uh specific way uh when you come to inferring r you tend to make these uh smoothing or moving average assumptions that kind of effectively pull you back into making a similar type of uh you know kind of, you could actually show that for like if you were looking at growth rates versus reproduction numbers, where people think growth rates might better account for some of these changes, when you look at the actual assumptions being used in the actual estimation, they kind of boil down to similar types of, uh, yeah. Often there's a convolution in there somewhere. Okay, yeah. thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Chris again.